Hey there, in this video, I'm going to show you almost everything you need to know about nodes, noodles, and all that stuff. So let's get started. So let's start off with the most basic thing. You've got your 3D viewport here, but you want to edit your nodes. So you need to learn to split your screen. To do that, put your mouse on any corner of an editor window and you'll see the cursor change to a crosshairs. You can do it on any, any of the four corners. You simply click and drag down and that will split your view in half. You can split that view in half the same way and then that in half and then that and half me before you know it, you've got a golden ratio within Blender. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> to unsplit an editor, you do pretty much the same thing, but in reverse. Click on a corner and drag over, and you'll see one area turn gray, and you can do that. Drag up. Awesome. Cool. So once you've got your view split, we're gonna change one of them to the shader editor. By habit, I always do the shader editor on top and my modeling on the bottom, but that's just me. This is mostly about nodes, so I'm just gonna make it pretty big. Inside the node editor, you've got two hidden panels on the left and right. On the left is T for tools, which gives you selection tools, annotation tools, and the cutting tool to cut a noodle in half. And on the right, which is letter N, you get the side panel, which kind of applies to anything you have selected, which we don't have anything right here. So with Suzanne selected, I'm gonna click new and make a new material. Now, most of the stuff we're gonna cover will apply to geometry nodes and even the compositor as well. So where are these infamous nodes? Where do you find them? Well, there's two basic ways. You can do the old way, which is click on the add, and then you've got all these nodes listed in each category. Who has time for two additional clicks, right? So what I do is press shift A, which is the add menu. And then I click on search and then I type in whatever I do. Now F3, at least on Windows for my computer, does the same thing, although it's a little bit cluttered and I just like the cleanliness of the search within the add menu to find things quickly. Now, once you have a node created and you're ready to connect things, these are called sockets. There's output sockets and input sockets. Data only flows in one direction within the node system. It's just like a river or electricity out of your outlet into your device through the power cable. And that's how I visualize the signal flow going from one node to the next. Generally, you have them laid out from left to right. So let's connect this color output of the Voronoi texture into the base color input of the BSDF shader. Now the data from the color output is flowing through into the base color. No matter how far away we move the nodes, they will always stay connected. And you can change these node settings within the preferences. Let's use our 3D viewport, turn it into the preferences editor, click on themes, and then go to node editor and expand it. Now you have a whole bunch of settings here, grid color, node color, noodle color, all the stuff. But what we wanna look at is the node curving. So right now it's set to four. If you put this at zero, everything will be straight lines all the time. If that's how you like, then just do that. I personally like a little bit of curve. I had it at four. Not sure how high this goes, 10. That bothers me. So <laughs> I like somewhere in the middle where there's a little nice curve, but you know, not too much. Now, don't get crazy with it. Once you've got that set, make sure to go to preferences and save preferences. And then let's go back to the 3D viewport. Now all nodes can be collapsed or hidden by selecting it and pressing the letter H. Or for my New Zealand friends, H. Pressing again will bring it back. This works for any node and it will keep all the sockets visible, which is kind of useless <laughs> because I mean, it's not like we're gonna plug something in right now, but you know, they're there just to show you where things are going in and out of. Now, the color of the noodle does matter. There's three different types of noodle connections within the material editor. Now, when you get to geometry nodes, there's some different types of data that it's using. But right now we've got three basic colors right here. We've got a gray noodle, which is simply a value, a black and white value. It can contain an image, but it's gonna be black and white. So it's from zero to one essentially are the values in gray scale. This can carry a single digit number, which would, if pictured in an image, make something solid black or white or somewhere in the middle, depending on the value. But you can also send data that contains images or textures, such as right here. I'm going to plug in this factor of this noise into the scale of the Voronoi. So now this very soft, cloudy texture is controlling the scale of the Voronoi texture and giving it a bunch of variety and randomness or I can make a value node, plug it into the scale and control it with a single value. Yellow noodles contain color image information, which would include RGB. So if I plug in the color output of this Voronoi texture into the base color of this material, we now have color, whereas before it was black and white. And this bluish purple noodle contains normals and or vector data, which has to do with location, direction, and three-dimensional space. It can be visualized if you plug it into something such as this. I'm gonna plug in the position vector output data into the color. And now we have this crazy color gradient going on 
I'm gonna smooth Susanna out. There we go, a little easier to look at now. And basically these different color values represent X, Y, and Z with positive and negative values. So down here is a negative Z, up here is a positive Z. Up here is the positive Y, here's negative Y. The colors change as you move in three-dimensional space and that's used for all kinds of complex material stuff, things like normals and bump map and displacement. You can use the grid feature to snap things to the grid inside the node editor. To do that, you can press shift tab or go up here and click on the magnet and select what you want it to snap on. Just the node X's, Y's, X and Y of nodes or the grid. So when I do that, you can see it snaps onto the dots of the grid, which you can control how large and small those are in the settings. If I do say node X, that means it's going to snap onto the, these vertical axes of different nodes. And that is very strange and crazy. I've never used that. <laughs> I prefer just the good old fashioned grid. All right, let's take it to the next level and I'm gonna explain frames and node groups to you. Let's say I've got a somewhat complex node set up over here that's gonna give me this trippy like energy wave marbly effect. And I want this to kind of be its own thing because as I start to create this more complex material, there's gonna be nodes all over the place and I want it to be nicely organized. How do I do that? Well, there's two options you have. There's frames and node groups. If you select all these nodes, which by the way, you have to have this marquee um, box select selected. You can also press letter B if you want to jump right to it. That allows you to do box select nodes. Now if I press control J, it creates a frame. What is a frame? Well, a frame is kind of what it sounds like. It just holds stuff. See, it's like a container and it will endlessly stretch and expand if I add a node to it. See, so if I drop it in, it automatically expanded. If I move stuff out, it's going to encompass all these things. Now, this is not in the frame right now. Unless I drop it inside, it will think it is inside the frame. But for now, it's not. It's still outside, even though the frame is stretching around it. So frames just make it nice to contain and move things around and, you know, have your whole signal flow kind of like a flowchart charted out and, and separated uh, by a function. Frames are awesome too, because you can label them and even color them. So I'm going to label this trippy surface. There we go. I can control the size of my label. Look at that. I can give it a color inside the frame and I can even apply a text inside here. So to do that, I, I don't type text in here. This is not going to work. This is looking for a text data object. So I'm going to change my editor to the text editor, make a new text object and type in instructions for use. Do not steal. I will find you. There we go. Okay, so that's my text object. I'm gonna name it uh, info. And then we can select over here. There it is, info, yay. Now we have our text in the background. We need we do need to move things around to make it visible, but I've used this on some of my products to bit, literally give instructions on, you know, tips and things on, on what to tweak and what things do. Uh, so that's cool. I, I do hope they increase the functionality where we can move this around. We can maybe even add images or further controls. That would be really cool maybe a scroll bar or something like that. All right, let's step back in time to before we created the frame and let's make a node group and show you what those do and why they're different. So again, I'm going to select all these guys and hit control G for group or node group. Now it takes us into this other little world of nothing else. Where do the other shaders go? Where are we? What's happening? Well, this is inside of a node group. Let me press tab to get out of that node group. And now we have this. Everything inside this little node group here is what we just created for this trippy surface. And it's still there. We can unplug it. We can plug it back in. So if you click on the icon up here, it gets you into edit mode, or you can press tab to edit a node group. And you have some really neat options here. Not only is this consolidating and organizing things, but now you have more control. You have multiple outputs you can play with. So I'm going to have all my individual outputs here just for fun. I'm even going to add some cool inputs. Like I want to control the mix factor. I want to control the scale. I want to control the randomness and the roughness from the outside world. What is the outside world? We'll press tab and here we are. This is our fancy schmancy little node group. I sell a bunch of different node groups on my Gumroad and Blender Market account that do all kinds of cool things for different effects. And it's nice because they're nice and contained. You can edit and tweak it if you want if you know how, but if you don't or don't want to tweak it, you don't have to, it's all right here. Look at this, I can control all those things I just gave myself access to, and that is awesome. And we also have the individual outputs still, which in this case contain the different stages of the procedural material creation. You have these inputs, so you can plug other things into these inputs to control them or tweak them. And when you make a node group, be sure to name it. So give the data block an actual name. So trippy surface group, just so I know what that is. You can give it a background color. 
you can label it. You can't do text or size the title though, because it's just a, it's working like an individual node. Frames are a little different. You can create um, presets for this. So I'm gonna call this like my surface color. Then I can make other colors, you know, for like bump and things like that. Give it a different color. Then you can select these different presets. If this helps you, then definitely make a few presets so you can use and keep things consistent. Let's go back into this node group. Let me show you one more advanced uh, feature that nodes have that frames don't, is you can set the limitations of these inputs and outputs. So I'm gonna go to the group tab over here. By the way, this is the letter N. Remember that side panel trick we did earlier on? If we click on a factor, let's say scale. I only want scale to go from .1 to dot. 56 because that's a specific range that I know is perfect. Now it cannot go over under this. You can set a default value as well. I'll do like dot two. Um, and you can name it, of course. You can change this, you know, like if you want to be really specific, noise two scale or something like that. And now if I tab out of it, we see that the title is updated and it can't go below dot one or above dot 56. I should have mentioned this earlier, but nodes can be stretched like this if you have really long titles to show everything that's in there. So that's how to set a input range. If I want to add a label within my node group, I can just do like uh, surface settings. And then this isn't really going to control anything. It did make an empty space over here. See, there's nothing plugged into it, but I'm going to choose hide value. Now, if I tab out of it, look, surface settings, there's nothing there, which is good. I just want it for, you know, just for the visual, the visualness of it. And if you need to, you know, you can add like, lines or something like that to like divide stuff up if you have a whole bunch of settings and it's just a lot to look at because complex node groups can get really tall. All right, let's move on to reroutes. This is something that I love. I love reroutes because they allow me to organize my stuff and make things visual and really clean. A reroute is just a little dot. If you go to your add layout and then click on reroute, look at this. I'm dragging around a little dot. What does it do? Drop it on top of a noodle and there you go. Now I can do multiple outputs from this one thing. Maybe I have another shader over here that I'm going to be uh, sending stuff to. I could add a dot here. So things go down, things go over and, you know, literally around things because you don't want noodles crossing underneath stuff. It gets really confusing when you have gigantic node groups to follow and see, you know, doing the wiggle trick. Where is this actually going? Oh, it's that one. And then you screw everything up. So use reroutes around. You can kind of do like a circuit board design like this to make things nice and organized. It even has a little arrow that shows you where the signal is going, which is really nice. If you select a reroute, you can press G to move it around. If you click and drag from it, it'll make a new noodle output. So if you want to move it, select it, and then G for move. Okay, I've just popped in my panel generator node group uh, just to show you what one of them may look like. These are all nicely organized and very well thought out. But let's say you've got a bunch of outputs or a bunch of signals going everywhere in your gigantic node, you know, rat's nest of noodles. And you want to preview what is what is this output or what does this node look like? Well, you can do that with a node wrangler add-on. I think by now it is by default enabled, but if it's not, go to your preferences, go to add-ons and make sure that node wrangler is enabled because it gives you some really cool shortcuts like this. Control shift click on any node and it will automatically give you a, a temporary shader preview of what that output looks like. If there's multiple outputs, Outputs, I can hold control shift and click again. It goes down to the next output, the next, the next, the next. And it just shows you using this viewer into the surface output what it really looks like. And then you can go back to normal by control shift clicking your last object in the chain, which for my case is this guy and it's back to normal shader preview. Okay, so again, I've got a chain of nodes here and I wanna preview each one with a node wrangler. Here's how you do it. Once again, hold control shift, click on one and it'll preview that one. And then what is this next node doing? We'll click on that one. Okay, it's adding some more contrast. This noise texture from the color output looks like this uh, colory noise. And then the next one is mixing them together. So it's allowing me to do this. And then finally it hits the shader and we get all the shading stuff going on. So that's why I love the node wrangler and it is crucial for more complicated node setups. Now, if you click on any node that already has a name, like color ramp, it's already named for us up here, but we can still rename it if we wanna add more details, like color ramp, which is actually just the data block name, my, my mistake. If we copy and then paste it to the label, there we go. Now this is the label. Just like the node group, we can apply a specific color to make it stand out. I released a procedural shader recently where I made all the blue nodes like the most important ones that were you know easiest and quickest to tweak to get different looks so that when you're looking at a big setup, you know, oh, the blue ones are where I need to go to first to do my most basic adjustments.
You can copy and paste nodes by selecting a node or a group of node and pressing Control C and then Control V, and then uh, use G to move that pasted uh, copy around. You can also select a node and press Shift D to duplicate, just like when you're modeling, Shift D will duplicate a face, a vertices, or an edge. If we go to our Node Wrangler tab over here, it, there's a lot of really interesting things that honestly I have barely scratched the surface on. But one cool thing is I've actually I've accidentally made the wrong node in the midst of a really tangled and confusing setup. Or I want to change this texture to something else, even though there's a whole bunch of stuff plugged into it. So instead of deleting this and trying to rewire everything and remember and not screw it up, I can actually use the Node Wrangler tab over here to switch node types. So I want to change this from a noise texture to a Veronoi texture. There we go, look at that. It kept most of the things that are connected with the same name, and now it's a Veronoi texture. Also with this Veronoi texture, let's see what happens if we do merge selected nodes. We can merge this with any other node. So use math nodes, I'll do multiply. And now this output has a multiply mix RGB added, or math, math node added to it. I can do use shaders, I can do an add shader, which basically just kind of automatically drops it in the chain of the first, it looks like the first output. I uh, know it's getting real messy, but uh, yeah, th this merge and switch are really handy over here. If you select a whole bunch of messy nodes and do align nodes, it does its best to center. It looks like on the vertical, it's kind of lines them up. You can modify labels here by adding suffixes or prefixes. You can copy label to other nodes. A lot of really just great time-saving features that Node Wrangler has added. I love it. Okay, one more cool trick. This is the bonus one. It's for free. I will not charge you for this tip. It's how to add an endless animation parameter and plug it into anything. Now I've got this noise texture set to 4D noise, which means that the W factor now pops up. And this is basically a endless um, evolution or progression through the noise pattern math that will just go on forever and ever and just give you completely random combinations. What if we animate this parameter? Now we can add keyframes, that's you know, relatively easy, but it takes up more time. So let's make a value node right there, connect the value to the W factor. And now we can click on this vac factor instead of typing in a number, which you know we could just already have done before, we can actually type it and replace it with number sign, frame, and then multiply or the asterisk times some number, one or dot one or dot zero one. Let's do dot zero one and enter. And now it's gonna grab the frame number, right? Hashtag frame, and then multiply that frame number for each frame times dot zero one. So if I press play, shift space bar for me, Look at this, the number you can see adding up as the frames roll on, it's multiplying frame number by dot zero one. So if I go back to frame 200, multiply that by dot zero one, we get the number two. As the frames progress, this animation and this number will never end and you don't have to do anything else to it. If you wanna speed it up, you can change that number times dot oh four, now it's evolving faster. And this just comes in really handy for things that you wanna rotate or scale or slide or organic things like water, wave textures that are morphing and moving continuously over time. It's a really great trick. You can set it to super slow, and get all kinds of really nice shifting, moving textures or vector information. So that is it for this video. I hope I cleared up some things. Hope I gave you some great tips that you can use. Let me know down in the comments if I missed anything or screwed something up and be sure to subscribe to my channel. Hope to see you again soon, bye.